So Hebrews chapter number 7, verse number 15 through 19. We're going to, no, no, we're going to read verse number 17. I'm sorry, verse 17 through and including verse 19. Do we have that? Yes, we do. All right. So let's read it together. And it says what? For he testified, thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. For there is verily a disannulling of the commandment going before, for the weakness and unprofitableness thereof. Look at verse number 19. For the law made nothing perfect, but the bringing in of a better hope did. Say praise God. Praise God. And let's read that last part together. By the which we draw nigh unto God. Pray with me now that the Lord, Lord will bless us with this message today. Father, in your blessed name of Jesus, we thank you for the kindness and goodness that you bestowed upon us. God, we ask you to come through the church with a rushing mighty wind. We ask you to come through the church with a healing power. We ask you to come through the church with anointing. We ask you to come through the church, oh God, with blessings. Let it shower from heaven on the hearers of the word and on those that are gathered together today. We give you the praise. We give you the glory. And let everybody say in Jesus' name. Precious, we holy, Master's wonderful name. Amen. We thank God for the word of God going forward today. And we know that God is a great God and he's going to do great things for us. Uh, amen. amen. We have a lot, as Brother Lawwood uh, uh, so aptly said as he came up to do our prayer, that there's a lot going on in the world today. Uh, there are a lot of things that are happening that we can't control. Amen. There are some things that just are going to take place because we're in that moment. I don't know about you, but I believe we're living in the last of the last days. Amen. 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 There's a time. And some people say, well, Brother Bacon, that might, that might be another 50 years. Okay, well, what are you going to do until then? Okay. <laughs> All right. So uh, some people might sit around twiddle their thumbs, but I would not recommend you do that. Amen. Uh, it may be tomorrow. Jesus could come any time, but we know that we're living in that last hour, amen, because we already have seen the signs, we know what's going on, and we can tell that God is getting ready to wrap things up, and so we thank God for living in this wonderful hour, I know I'm excited about it, amen, that I can be zapped away from here any day now, amen, you guys can have all the stuff I leave behind, I can talk to my wife, and uh, you, can, <laughs> you can get whatever you want, amen, because it's not going to do me any good where I'm going, all right, so I I thank God for just having that knowledge that we are dealing with these times. And now uh, we're dealing with the COVID. The COVID is still around and people are still, as we can see from the wearing on masks and everything, that people are still cautious about that. Amen. Uh, and I, but th just the other day, I saw a uh, t-shirt and I was going to buy this t-shirt. I went, where's my son? Uh, there he is. Uh, maybe he can do, I think he does that print screen kind of stuff. Because I was going to buy this t-shirt, but it was $35. Amen. So I said, no, I just can't pay $35 for that. I mean, that might cause an uprising in the house. Amen. So anyway, <laughs> so I, uh, but it's had on the t-shirt, uh, uh, God doesn't have COVID. So you can get as close as you want to him. Man, I gotta get one of those. I gotta get one of those t-shirts. Amen. So that's what we're gonna be talking about today. Uh, and our subject for the day is draw closer to God. Draw closer to God. Amen. Uh, I, I want to uh, turn your attention as we go into our text, Brother Paul, chapter number 7. You can read chapter number 7 and 6. The entire book of Hebrews is a book written to the Hebrew Christians. And they were going through some persecution at the time because much of the Jews wanted them to return to Judaism. And so, uh, Brother Paul, as though I, some scholars don't believe Paul wrote that book because of the style of his writing, but I accredited it to Paul, and I think that's as good as what they don't do. So anyway, uh, Brother Paul wrote that, and uh, he wrote, wrote it to the Hebrew Christians, and he's telling them in much of the book, the entire book really is centered around the supremacy of Jesus Christ. If you wanted a central theme for it, I would give it that, that he wanted to show that through the law, the angels, and all the other things that they talk about, none of those things are supreme to Jesus. Jesus, that Jesus stands above all those things and that you can go back to the law and if you did you would be going backwards. Amen. Say amen somebody. Amen. I don't know about you but I don't want to go back to kindergarten. Uh -huh. <laughs> amen. I had fun in kindergarten. I don't know me wrong. Amen. I had a great time. I just love that chocolate milk. Amen. They had chocolate milk that was just, I don't know where you got that from, but it was very good. But I don't want to go back there just to get chocolate milk. 
Amen. I'll stop to the store and pick up another cup somewhere else, but I don't want to go back for that. And so Paul is talking in the book of Hebrews to let them know uh, you're going backwards if you go back to the law. Amen. So once we break up to chapter number seven, he begins chapter number seven talking about uh, Melchizedek. And we, and we have heard much about Melchizedek. Some people uh, say he was uh, Jesus, Jesus, and some people say he was, he was G a type of Jesus. I go along with that all that he was a type, a shadow, a picture, or image based on his name and what his name meant that he was a type of Jesus. King of righteousness is what the Bible calls him. The king of Salem. Salem actually indicates a word that means peace. And so uh, we know that Melchizedek, who met uh, Abraham in the in the desert in, in uh, Genesis chapter number fourteen or fifteen in that area that he uh, came and he was a type of Christ and Paul begins his his dissertation if you want to call it that of chapter seven by talking about that and he talks about how how Melchizedek uh, because that he was considered to not have mother or father not beginning or ending that he was an everlasting priest and so then when we see that as a type of Christ we know that Christ is everlasting Lasting, that there's no beginning and no end, and there's no there's no stopping to him. He, the Bible says, he is the immortal God. Amen. So Paul, as he begins to bring this down, he brings us down to verse number 16, and he says to us, basically, the law being carnal, the law came from Moses. God instituted it through Moses and gave the law. And he said the law uh, was a carnal thing, but after the power of the law, nobody could be saved. And it didn't have what it needed to have. But Jesus, uh, who was made after the Melchizedek, had endless life. And he began to contrast the two and show the people, look, when you're talking about Jesus, you're talking about an endless life. And not only that, Paul says, he comes down to our text as we begin to read, and he says in verse 18, there is then a disannulling of the commandment going before, of the weakness and unprofitableness thereof. Uh, what's he talking about? Well, he, he explains that. Uh, the word disannul uh, uh, in, in the Hebrew is a kuru, uh, and it basically means that I'm going to put something away or get rid of it, okay? Okay? It means that I'm going to uh, uh, move aside from that thing. And so Paul explains uh, that the law was unprofitable because it couldn't do anything to really save you. Uh, all the, the uh, shedding of blood and the bulls and the goats and the thousands of sacrifices that were made I mean, every single day, day in and day out, Paul said that couldn't do it. We were still held at a distance from God and we still could not approach God because every single day, God was was reminded that we were still sinners. I don't know about you, but if I did something to somebody 15 years ago, I sure hope they wouldn't throw it in my face 15 years later. My pastor told me one time before I got married, you might remember this is fake. He said, don't start anything you can't keep up. That's one thing. Because your wife is going to want you to keep it up 15 years from now. He was right about that. <laughs> then he said, we're going to have a wedding. I said, well, Pastor, if it's all the same to you, we could just go down to the justice of the peace. And he said, this is not your day, Brother Bacon. It's your wife's day. <laughs> Furthermore, if you do that, 20 years from now, you'll be sitting in the living room and she won't have any pictures from that wedding. And she's going to remind you how you snuffed her out of a whip. <laughs> well, he was right about that. Because even though we had the win, the pictures were horrible. <laughs> we didn't come away with not one good picture. God help us. And 20 years later, my wife said, I don't have one good picture from the win. So being the husband I was that loved my wife, I instituted a plan so that we could escape to Niagara Falls, bed and breakfast. Actually had a custom cake design. Had a girl sit in, I had a custom dress made for my wife, unbeknownst to her. Flew my kids and our friend up to Niagara Falls for a surprise 20 year anniversary, 25 year anniversary. Because there was not a single picture, I hired a professional photographer from Canada. Show up down there if you would please. So we can make sure that this lady gets some pictures. <laughs> All that happened because I did not know 
that things were going to unfold the way they did. Sometimes we don't realize what we're doing until we get down the road. And we begin to look back at where things have come from. In our talking about this drawing near to God, we need to go back to the beginning so we can look where we came from. Amen. You see, in the beginning is my first thought. I like to go back to the beginning because the beginning is where it all started. We were connected to God. Somebody say connected. connected. We were in the garden with God. When I say we, I mean Adam. We were in the garden with God. We had fellowship with God. We could talk to God. He could talk to us. He could show up anytime. We loved it when he showed up. He couldn't wait till he came. Hated it when he left. I mean, we had complete fellowship with God. But then let me tell you what happened. Sin came into the garden. Amen. And as soon as Adam sinned, that whole chain of fellowship, that closeness, that nearness was broken. And we read those dreadful words in the book of Genesis, in chapter number 3, I think it's verse number 24, when he said, And so God drove out the man. The word drove indicates cast out, throw out, thrust out, expel. He didn't just ask him to leave, he drove him out. And so then we were driven out into the world where we were separated from God. Never to be able to get back again, or so it seemed. Mm -hmm. We couldn't get back because we had no way back. Okay, well, God in the garden, he said, I'm going to prolong this thing. I'm going to give you a chance. And so I'll send out a word of prophecy. Genesis 3.15, he gives us a word of prophecy. I will put thy seed, he tells the serpent, as enmity between the seed of the woman. And he shall bruise your head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. That is the first prophetic word about the Messiah that we read in the Bible in Genesis 3.15. So there, God launches a program to save you and I, to get us to the point that we can draw nearer to him. See, in the beginning, God saw that down the road, we were going to need closeness. Hello, somebody. Body, and he began to set things in motion so that we could have that kind of closeness down here in 2022. So he said, listen, I'm going to make it so that he's going to come and bruise your head, devil, and he's going to put you in the place where you belong. But until then, we've got to do something for these poor people because they're going to be separated from me. I'm going to cast them out of this garden and they're going to go into the wilderness where there are thorns, where there are thistles, where there are briars and wires, and the things are not going to grow so good the way they used to do in this paradise. And I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to kill the first animals, and I'm going to take their skin. Adam and Eve sewed fig leaves, and they made aprons. How many people know that man's clothing is never enough? Amen. Amen. God came in and took an animal and made coats to cover their bodies. Because now that their conscience was awakened, they knew they were naked. And this wasn't a good thing to them. I want to tell you something. Everything in the world changed the moment sin stepped in the picture. Men don't look at women the way they should and the way they used to. Women don't look at men the way they should and the way they used to. People don't get along the way they should and the way they used to. People don't act the way they used to and could. People don't talk to one another and love one another the way they should. Everything about us changed the moment sin came into the picture. If you wonder why we have earthquakes, that changed. There was never an earthquake before then. If you wonder why we have thunderstorms, that changed. There was never a thunderstorm before then. If you wonder why there was death and mayhem, that changed. There was never a murder before then. If you wonder why there are so many people who have abortions all over the place and children born out of wedlock and sickness and disease like COVID, there was all that change. None of that was in the world before sin came in. Sin brought in everything that we see today that we hate. You need to understand that. And we were separated from God, kicked out of the garden, and could not get back. 
And then as time went by, only a few people were able to get close to God. We read in Genesis chapter 5, the Bible says Enoch walked with God. And he walked so closely with God that God said, I'm going to spare this guy. This guy is so close to me, I'm just going to take him off the earth. Oh, man, can you imagine being that close to God? That we were so close to him that he said, I'm not even going to let you go through the stuff that you're going to live through. I'm going to spare you and take you right out of this earth. That was the first thing we ever saw in the Bible anywhere close to what we can consider a rapture or a catching away. He just snatched Enoch up and said, no, man, I'm just going to take you. And then we see generations went by and nobody really served God. You see, people were so estranged from God. He even said in one chapter in the book of Genesis, my spirit will not always strive with man because they are flesh. I'm going to number his years to be 120. He's not going to make it much past that. Okay? And then later on in Psalms chapter number 9 and 10, he brought our years down to 70 and 5. How many people know people that live more, uh, more than 75 years? Nowadays, we got people say, oh, there's a lot of people really making that living past 75. Yeah, but there's a whole lot more than that or not. He brought our years down. While we were separated, sin multiplied too rapidly. It was like a cancer. And then as time went by, God brought in Abraham to begin to start his nation, to work his way back to get Jesus into the picture. He brought in Isaac, and he brought in Jacob, and Jacob had 12 sons, and those 12 sons went down to Egypt with 70, 60, uh, 69 or 70 souls, and they became the people of Israel, living among the Egyptians for 430 years. They toiled and they labored, and then God brought them out. Still, they were estranged to God, but God began to say, I'm going to do something to bring us back a little closer. But when he instituted the the Levitical priesthood, as Paul talked about, guess what he did? He said, not everybody's going to come close to me. No. Get 70 elders. Bring them up to the mountain. You find this in the book of Exodus. Bring them up to the mountain, round chapter number 19. Bring them up to the mountain. But be careful. Put a border around the mountain and tell them to keep back. Don't let them go beyond this boundary. If so much as a hand gets crossed this boundary, kill it. If there's an animal that gets crossed this boundary, spear him through with a spear. I want the people to keep back. God said if they peer through and gaze as I'm talking to them from the mountain, I'm going to kill somebody. So you tell them, stay back. You come up, Moses, but you keep them back. See, we were still kept at arm's length. God still pushed us away. Why? Because Isaiah said in 59 and 2, your sins and your iniquities have separated you before God. Let me tell somebody something that's sitting here today. If you want to go close to God and you've got sin in your life, friend, you can forget it. You've got to get that sin out of your life. You've got to repent and tell God, I'm sorry. You've got to put that thing down that you've been picking up. You've got to tell God, I won't go back to that anymore. When God saves you, you don't go back to the things in the world that you used to do. If you want to go nearer to God, you can't draw near with sin in your hand. You can't draw near with sin in your life. You've got to separate from something, and it's got to be the sin. Amen. So God said, tell them to stay back. If anybody comes close, I'm going to pierce you through. And God spoke to them from the mountain. And then what God did, he said, I'll tell you what I'm going to do, Moses. I'm going to pick the tribe of Levi. Jacob had 12 sons. Levi was his third son, I do believe. And he took that, that took that name and that tribe and he made the Levitical priesthood from the tribe of Levi. Moses came out of that tribe. He was born under the tribe of Levi. And then Aaron, Moses' older brother, became the first high priest. And now here's what God did. He said, I want you to find this in Numbers chapter number 3, verse number 6. I, I want you to take the Levites. Let the Levites come near to me. See, everybody just couldn't come near to God. Now he's choosing one tribe. I want the Levites. Bring them near to me. They're going to minister to me. And I want you to bring them in here. And I want you to show them what they're going to do. You couldn't be a priest if you weren't in a Levitical priesthood. You couldn't come near to the altar if you weren't in a Levitical priesthood. If you were left-handed, you couldn't come near and be a priest. Oh, there I go. I, would, I wouldn't make it. Okay? You couldn't be a priest if you had a crooked nose. Amen. I think everybody here would get through with that one. Amen. But I, you couldn't even minister to God if you were not in the priesthood. If you had a lame leg or a uh, broken uh, 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 arm or anything of that nature, you could not minister to the priest. Amen. And you could not minister before God. Amen. Give me the Levitical priesthood. And the Levitical priesthood are the only people that I want to see in here. Yes. If a stranger, he says, comes in here and touches anything in this tabernacle, kill him. 
Now, some of us, you guys look at me off the string, but some of us ought to understand that. We don't talk to strangers when we get on the bus. Some people will never talk to a stranger. That's why God has to give some of us the Holy Ghost and change us because we would never talk to strangers otherwise. Some of us will never do that. And I don't know anybody that goes up to a stranger and hugs him. No, I won't do that. No, you won't do that? Not many people will do that. Some people will. Yeah, some people have that. They'll just say, oh, they, oh yeah. And then they go, Where, where's my wallet? Yeah. <laughs> I thought I felt a little light. <laughs> some people would do that, but not many of us, amen, will go up to a stranger. And God said, if there's a stranger that comes near, don't let him come near my stuff. You keep the stranger away. But even in the people of, of, that weren't Levitical priests, that weren't Le uh, Levites, they just couldn't come. You'll find this in 2 Samuel chapter number 6, verse number 6 and 7. Amen. A man named Uzzah, when they were carrying the ark on the on the, uh, 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 on the cart, and they were doing it wrong in the first place, they were carrying it on the cart, and an ox was pulling it. And Uzzah, that ca cart, was going over a bump, and the ox kind of moved, and the cart kind of tilted, and he thought the ark of the covenant was going to fall, and the Bible says he put forth his hand to hold it, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against him because of his error, and God killed him on the spot. Amen. Uzzah was not a tribe of, uh, uh, of Levites. Look it up. Uh, he was not. Nobody who was even doing that whole thing was a Levite. They were wrong right there. And then secondly, they should have not been carrying it on the cart. They should have had the Levites uh, carrying it on their shoulders with the staffs that he made to put it on the side of the ark. And when David figured that out, he said, oh my goodness, uh, we can't bring this thing close to us. Let's sit it over here for a while until we figure out what to do. And then he went and found out from the priest, you were doing it wrong. And so God killed the man because you didn't know what you were doing. That's how much God kept us away from him. Because of our sin. That's what he did. He didn't want to do that. But he did. Most of us wouldn't do get close to a stranger. I remember one time when I was in school. In college I was drinking a, drinking a Coke. At our, uh, uh, one of our breaks we were having. And I had a Coke in my hand. I think I told, told you this before. But I had this Coke in my hand. And one of the classmates, and I, and I didn't know the guy except for his name. And in fact, he was in our class. Uh, I was drinking my Coke. And he said, hey, Bacon, you mind if I have a swig of that? I just kind of froze. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I was, uh, and then he kind of noticed the look on my face. And he said, I didn't mean to offend you. I said, well, you know, I can get you a soda if you want one. They're, they're not that expensive. And he said, no, I just thought maybe you'd let me have a swig of yours. I said, you can have, I mean, you can have it. <laughs> We're going to drink out to a stranger, are we? I mean, I might drink out to Sister Bacon. I'm keeping my eyes on her. I mean, you know, make sure, you know, amen, make sure she's not dribbling in the cup. <laughs> amen, amen. We're not going to do that for a stranger. <laughs> no. My youngest son, he was real particular about that. He wouldn't drink out to the other two boys. Oh, no. He had some. Oh, no. I'll get my own. I'll do it out. <laughs> I'll do it out. They hated it when we went to a restaurant. They said, we said, oh, you guys got to share a meal. Share that. Oh, whoa, no. <laughs> People were estranged from God because God kept us at bay and we couldn't come near to him. We were like the plague. We were like COVID. Amen. Amen. We had to stay afar off. Amen. Thank God. But Paul was saying, listen, but there came a high priest uh, who was different from all the other high priests. Uh, he put away the first covenant that he may establish another covenant. And this priest was Jesus Christ. Uh, he's not like the others uh, in that he hasn't in his life. Uh, his life goes on and on and on. Uh, when he does a sacrifice, you don't have to worry about God coming back tomorrow and saying you still have sin on you. When Jesus does a sacrifice, you are clean. Uh, when he does a sacrifice, you prepare. Uh, when he does a sacrifice, uh, you're ready. When he does a sacrifice, you can go in through the holies of holies. You don't need the priest in to make an offering. You can come boldly to the throne of grace. When Jesus makes a sacrifice, it's not like the priest of the Old Testament. When Jesus makes a sacrifice, you can draw near unto God. You can get this to hello somebody. When Jesus does it, you can draw near. It changes the game, friend. It changes your stance. The Paul said, you that were afar off, has he brought near. You were once alienated from him, Paul said. From the commonwealth of Israel, you were a nothing. You were a nobody. You were lower than the low. Amen. And you were at a cricket ankle. Amen. You were at that point where God didn't know who you were. But thank God for Jesus coming in on the scene. Thank God for a high priest. After our profession, who can get us through to the holy of holies? 
who became a sacrifice for our sins. Now we can draw near. Now there's no more strangers. Amen. I remember, I remember hearing a song when I was 16, and it's, I, can, I don't even know the whole song, but I remember hearing the lyrics when I was in my car. Just to be close to you. I said, oh, that sounds nice. Amen. Just, just to be close to you. I don't know what the rest of the song is, but just to be close to you. I said, oh, man, I got to thinking about that. I mean, can you imagine that? See, some of us, we want people to come close. Some of us like it when our hus husband or wife give us a nice bear hug. Mm -hmm. And we like that. Amen. We don't want some hug like this from a distance as if we got the cooties or something. Oh, no, friend. We want to come in close. Amen. I want to tell you something. God wants you close. He don't want to try to hug to you and give you his love from way out there. He knew all along that this was not what I wanted. I want somebody I can rub shoulders with. Oh, I thank God for that. We can love on the Lord and he can love on us. I thank God that he said, come here. Draw nearer to me. You weren't from the tribe of Levi, but I'll make you a royal priesthood. I'll make you a priest so that you can come near to me. Hallelujah. You'll find that in 1 Peter chapter number 2, verse 9, where the Lord said, you are a royal priesthood. Amen. You are a royal priesthood. If you've got the Holy Ghost in you, you can't get any nearer to God than that. Amen. Hello, somebody. Amen. You've got a royalty in your spirit, in your heart. This is why we need to get the Holy Ghost saints. This is why we need God to fill us with the gift of the Holy Ghost. I'm going to tell you right now, if you're sitting in this pew and you don't have the Holy Ghost inside of you, I want you to begin to think about what you're giving up. I want you to begin to think about the privilege that God bought you, the privileges that he died for, the privileges that you're not enjoying. I want you to think about the things that you're not getting your hands on, that you're so far from God. But when you get the Holy Ghost up, God said, I'm not going to call you a servant any longer. You are my son. You're my daughter. Oh, you can come closer. Hug me. Love on me. Kiss on me. I love you back because you're somebody. Draw near. Draw near unto God. Amen. The Bible tells us that Jesus was that one who brought us near. He paved the way. I love the scripture in Ephesians chapter number 2, verse 8 and 9. We are saved by grace through faith. I love that scripture. It was the grace of God you saw hanging on the cross. It was the grace of God that opened the door for you and me. It was the grace of God that brought us near when we were far off. It was the grace of God that opened the way for us to be saved. It was the grace of God that showered love on us when we were loveless. There was the grace of God that gave us hope when we were hopeless in a dying situation. It was the grace of God that parted the Red Sea to God so that we can walk through to the holiness of holies and touch the face of God. But grace, grace did all that. Do a word search one time and look at how many times you see the word grace in the Bible. Huh? Hundreds of times, even in the Old Testament. People think grace just showed up in the New Testament. It didn't. It's been around since God's been around. Yeah. Really, God's grace and his mercy are almost the same thing. But we call them different because of the way the application is to us. Grace is unmerited favor. You get what you don't deserve. Something good, even though you're bad, you don't deserve that. That's unmerited. It's not warranted. You don't deserve it. Mercy is not giving you what you do deserve. You broke the law. You passed through the speeding limit. You should go to jail, but I'm going to let you go. You should do a prison sentence, but I'm going to set you free. That's mercy. God gives us grace and mercy. The Bible says the law, the Paul said the law brought us death. Come on, somebody. The law brought us death, but he brought grace and mercy at the cross. Jesus said, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. This was the last thing he said almost before they put him on that tree. Why? Because he wanted us to know that you've got grace. And I've opened the way to you. I've paved the way for you. Now you can come on in. But faith, faith is what we do. Faith is our stuff. I don't know about you, but I don't know any two people who can have a decent relationship and one person trying to do all the work. Hello, somebody. Amen. If you're in a relationship like that, you're doing all the work, you ain't going to want to start rethinking things. Amen. You might want to start doing some investigation. What's going on here? Amen. Amen. One person can't do all the work. It takes two to tango, as they say. Right? Amen. And they, it takes two to fix the tango when the tango ain't tangoing. <laughs> Hello, somebody. 
We got to get this thing right. Grace and faith is a relationship thing. God said, I want you to come near. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to send Jesus, the male Chesedic that you saw, the type of shadow, the real one is here before you. I'm going to let him open up the pathway. That's grace. But your job is to enact your faith. Your job is to get your faith moving. Your job is to believe the gospel. Your God's job is to repent. Your job is to get baptized. Your job is to get rid of your sin. Your job is to lay down what you're doing and come to God. Your job is to forget about that stuff and pick up the heavenly stuff. Your your job is to tell God, I want to draw near to you. Your job is to start your feet moving and begin to walk to God. Your job is to walk through the door that God gave you. Your job is to lay down at the altar and let him stay the old you so a new you can rise up. Your job is to tell God, yes, I want to come near. Yes, I want to draw closer. Yes, I need you. Yes, I'll do it, Lord. Your job is to accept his grace. Glory, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Our job is to accept the method of salvation that God gave us so that we can draw near. We can come closer. We can get closer to God. I love the way God does this thing. Amen. The Bible says the interest of thy word give it light. And the more we read the word of God, the more light we get. The more we study the word of God, he turns on the light. I don't know what you pray, but every time I get on my knees in the morning, I say, God, please, I'm going to look at that Bible, and I need you to open my mind so I can feed the sheep. Because if you don't give it to me, I can't give it to them. Enlighten me, God. Feed my soul. I want to tell you something. And when I turn those pages, I can feel God drawing me near. Come on closer. I take you a little deeper. Come on closer. I'll give you more revelation. Come on closer. I'll open your mind a little more. I want you to know something. You can draw closer. You don't have to stand and fly out. Draw close to God. You don't have to stay out a long ways off. I love it when Peter preached the first message on the day of Pentecost. You know what he said? He says, for this gospel, this promise, is unto you, and to your children, and what else? And to as many as are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Oh, I praise God for that. I praise God for that. And I thank God, he's not a respecter of persons. Amen, he doesn't care what color your hair is. He doesn't care if you don't have any hair. I'm not looking at you. If he doesn't care, amen, if you just got one or two strands, amen, he doesn't care if you're black or white, if you're from Spain, if you've got a degree or you can't spell me, he doesn't care. What God cares about is that somebody draws near that was far off. He cares about the soul that comes to him. He cares about a life that's going to be changed and rearranged. He cares about a soul that's going to be taken up the glory. He thinks about a soul that's going to peer through and get to the holiest of holies. God cares about us being saved. Draw near. Draw near, he said. Bring the Levites near to me. I don't have a priesthood yet, but I'm going to make one. Because Jesus is going to come, and I'm going to make them all royal priests. When you become baptized in Jesus' name, you are a priest believer, and you operate in the priesthood. Let me help somebody here. This is why we can't just let anything and everything go on in our lives, because we are holy. When he made that ephah for Aaron, and he put that matri on his head, and he get that crown up there, he told Moses, put those holy garments on him. These garments are holy, and I don't want him to just strut around town in them. He puts them on when he comes to do the work in my house, and he better have them on. Let me tell you something. When God makes something holy, they better not show up unholy because they may not get out alive. I want you to know something. When God touches you and changes your life and separates you, you are his. You don't belong to the world. You no longer can do what you want to do. You belong to Jesus because he's brought you near. You can tell the devil, get your hands off me. Amen. Take your dirty, filthy paws off of what God belongs to, what he owns. 
I am his and he is mine. I thank God for the old hymn we used to sing that. I am his and he is mine. Thank God for that. He brought us closer. We used to sing the song, nearer my God to thee. Nearer my God to thee. I just want to get nearer. Amen. That's my desire to get nearer. Why? Because the light begins to open, friend. The privileges that are in the New Testament, they become ours. The liberty that God gave us, we can see it in his word. Who wouldn't want such liberty? Who wouldn't want to get free from the bondage? The law put the curse on us, but Christ took the curse off of us. We ought to be glad of that. We ought to thank God that there's no more curse on us. We can come near to God. We can go near to the one that loves us. Somebody may be saying, Brother Bacon, tell me now how, before you leave, how can we draw near? I want to tell you about that. Here's how to get close to God. The first thing you got to do is you need the Holy Ghost. Friend, let me tell you something. The Bible says there's one God, one Father of all, who is above all and through you all. You'll find that in Ephesians, chapter number four, verse number four through six. Paul said, listen, in the process of time, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem them that was under the curse of the law. You'll find that in Galatians, chapter number four, verse four through six. But Paul said, wherefore, because you are Sons. God sent forth his spirit of his son crying Abba Father when you get the Holy Ghost you're going to cry something and it's going to be Abba Father you're going to say Daddy Daddy you're going to say some language but it's going to be the comfort of God that that is my son that is my daughter bring them near to me as I bring them into the kingdom of God we need to understand how this thing works. David said in Psalms chapter number 65 and 4, Bless them, them, blessed is those who God will brought near. Blessed is the man that God lets come close, that he can enter into his courts. Amen. Do you know how blessed you are that God will bring you into his courts? Not everybody gets into the courts of God. And how blessed you are that can come before his throne. Do you know how blessed you are that you can draw near? Do you know how blessed you are that you can cry to God and he'll hear you? Do you know how blessed you are? You don't need a priest. You need to open your mouth. And say, God, here I am. We know how blessed you Draw near. James and James number four, verse number eight, said, draw close to God. He uses the word nigh. Nigh means close. It means in proximity that is right out of reach, right within reach. It says, draw nigh unto me. It means very close. It's not like we're standing off and I'm having to throw something to you. When you're nigh unto me, I can reach out and touch you. My mother used to do that when she wanted to whip us with a switch. <laughs> she sat on the couch and she said, go get me a stick. I'm going to be the go get the stick. We go into the woods, we get the pocket knife, and trim a limb off a tree, and we try to keep the leaves on it. <laughs> right? Because it doesn't sting as much when the weed leaves are on it. The leaves get caught up in the wind as she's swinging it, and it pushes the blow. No. You learn those tricks when you grow up like I did. <laughs> get that switch. And so we get one, and we cut, she come when she breaks it. It's too short. Well, what do you mean it's too short? Go get another. Don't make me go get one. So we go out and get along. Maybe from here to that end of that organ right there. We knew we were going to get it, but we had to be obedient. Here you go, Mama. Now come close to me, she said. <laughs> she didn't want to get off the couch. She sat on the couch. She sat on the couch just like this. Now come here to me. Come here to me. <laughs> I don't want to come to you. I don't want to come to you you got that thing in your hand. <laughs> I know better than that. The donkey outside knows better than that. Come here to me, she would say. And by the time you got her, you just move. And she already knew that you're going to jerk back. So as you were moving forward, she slid a little bit off the edge of the couch. Uh -huh. So when you took one step, I woo! Like, there you go, she. And you think, oh, she missed me until you look see that well on her. No, she didn't. She got me. Come near to me, she said. And man, if she could get her hands on you. She put your head between her legs, call you into that like that, get your, your pants on the backside and jack them up a little bit so she don't have to bend too far, and she just go to work. <laughs> but thank God for Jesus. He's not going to do that to us when we get near. He's going to love on us. He's going to kiss us and tell us you're my pride. You're my joy. I saved you when you were dying because I loved you. I saved you and I battled over you with love. I saved you because I wanted you to be near me. I'm not going to hurt you. You've had enough of that in the world. I'm going to love you and take you to glory. Yeah. Somebody ought to be happy. Somebody ought to be glad. Somebody ought to thank God. Somebody ought to praise his name. Somebody ought to shout hallelujah. Somebody ought to give God a praise. Somebody ought to be I'm tired of being a freak. 
Everybody's going to be invited to the marriage supper. Amen. Some people, they do their reception. Amen. And they don't have everybody on the list. Some people can come and some people can't. Well, God's got the same program. Some people are not going to be able to be there and some will be. But we will be in the bride. So you know we'll have front row seats. Oh, praise God for that. We'll be there. But we're the bride. Amen. Thank God for that. Amen. You've got to understand this. You need the Holy Ghost. Yeah. And then you need prayer. Hallelujah. Praying is talking to God. You get somebody on the phone calling you and you haven't heard from them for a while, what do you do? Who is it? No. Somebody called me the other day and I didn't recognize the number, I just looked at it. I don't know who that is. He's one of the bishops in our organization. I said, oh, he's, so he sent me an email and a text. Thank God he did that because I would have never asked him for <laughs> Why? I didn't know who it was. Some of us haven't talked to God in so long. We haven't been on our knees in so long. If that's you, you ought to just start repenting where you sit. Amen. You haven't talked to God in a long time. You haven't told God all about the situation, even though he knows all about it anyway. You've been trying to hide it, and you've been trying to tuck it under the rug, but God sees your smug rug, and he's going to bring you out of there. He's going to bring that thing out. Make sure you know this. Your sin will find you out. And friend, let me tell you something. You can't hide from a God that sees everything. So we might as well pull the cover off and begin to pray to God. God, I need you. We need to do like the man in the Bible. In the book of Luke, chapter number 18, the poor uh, uh, tax collector, the Bible says, he smote his chest. He wouldn't even look up to heaven. He was so embarrassed for the sin he done. He said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Some of us need to know that we need to pray and tell God, I'm tired of being estranged. I want to come near and be somebody you can love. Yeah. Yeah. Some of us need to get a revelation that we're not praying. You know, there's people who think we can't hold back the things of this world. That everything's going to be, it's going to be what it's going to be, so nothing we can do about it. Yes, there is. If my people who are called by my name, 2 Chronicles chapter number 7, verse 14, right? Shall I humble them, do what? Humble themselves. That's the first step. The first step to a decent prayer is humility. People who don't pray, you know why they don't? Because they got too much pride. Hello, somebody. If you don't pray, quit telling people you're humble because you're not. Don't tell another soul you're humble if you don't pray. Because that's a lie. If my people who are called by my name, we want to be called by his name, don't we? We want to come near, don't we? Then pray. Yes. The way up to what God is down. The more you go down on your knees, the more God lifts you up. You want to get your circumstance changed? I'm going to tell you how to do it. Stay on your knees before God, and he'll begin to lift you above that circumstance. I'll tell you right now that if you'll talk to God regularly, God will answer you regularly. He'll do what you need him to do when you need it done. He'll get you out of the pickle when you're in the pickle. He'll go through the fire with you, and he'll bless you. I'm not talking about what I read. He'll bless you because you know how to pray. 
The next thing you need to do, and I'm coming to the close of my, of my message here, you need to learn to fast sometimes. Oh, I know, Brother Bacon, that's a horrible word in the church, isn't it? Fasting and praying. Oh, my goodness, what kind of church is this? Amen. I hope it's a Holy Ghost filled one. Amen. Praise God for that. Amen. You've got to fast sometimes. you got to push that plate back. Oh, man, sometimes we got to tie ourselves from the refrigerator and get on our knees and pray and kick in the fast. Amen. I think about when, you, when the Lord sent Jonah to Nineveh. He said, go to them and preach. Jonah didn't want to go. Because a historical document to say that the people of Nineveh were people who killed his ancestors. He didn't want them to get saved. But he went. And when the king heard what Jonah told him, he put everything on a fast. Feed, don't feed an animal, nor man or beast or anything for three days. And the cry of the people went up before God. My Lord, my Lord. You want God to answer you? Put that plate down for a few days. Hey man, somebody, oh hallelujah, I feel the anointing already in somebody's life. Put that plate down for a few days and get on your face before the Lord. You know in the Old Testament it took three days for them to consecrate themselves and get ready to meet God? Change your garments. Be clean. Don't go at your husband and your wife for three days. Meet back here and I'll have you consecrated. You couldn't just waltz up to God any way you want back then. You had to get prepared. Fasting prepares you to enter into the place of God. Fasting gets you into the zone, friend. Fasting will bring you into a place that God can hear you because it kills the flesh. Amen. And with your flesh out of the way, God can hear your spirit. I may look like I'm totally insane, but I know what I'm talking about. Amen. Someone said, well, bad blood bacon, there go my closeness right there. I don't know if I could give up my meals. <laughs> well, I don't know about you, but I know what it's like to pray and get in the throne room of God. And man, I'm telling you something. While that fasting hurts my body, that spiritual touch that I give in that throne room is well worth those days of fasting. I'm going to tell you right now, because when God lays his hands on you, friend, there's nothing like that. When he touches you, and then man, like Isaiah, amen, and Ezekiel, when he took the hot coal and stuck on his tongue, and he said, now you're clean. When God touches you with a hot coal and puts a fire in you, there's nothing like that. And I want to tell you something. If you don't know it, you ought to get used to knowing it. You ought to want to know. Yeah. Man, you've got to do this one thing. Yeah. Quit limiting yourself. I hear so many people that I wish I could tell, say, close your mouth. Because I get tired of hearing somebody say, I'm not good enough. I'm not worthy. I'm just never going to make it. I'm not pretty enough. I'm not handsome enough. And my eyes don't look like their eyes. And I don't know what I'm going to do. And woo, woo, woo. And whoa, whoa, whoa. And I want you to tell me something. God never said you had to do any of that. What he said you had to do was love him with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And he'll do the rest. Quit looking at somebody else. Quit looking at yourself on what somebody else has. And you let that God know, I love you. And I want to come near to you. As I close this message, there's got to be some obedience. Yeah. Yeah. One of our sons was really good at, I used to call him a yes man. Because he would always say, when we said, go do this or that, he said, yes sir, daddy, yes sir, or yes ma'am. But five minutes later, he would be doing something else. <laughs> Did we tell you to go do that? Yes, sir, Dad. Yes, sir. I'm going to do that right now. <laughs> I used to have a guy that worked for me at the VA hospital was like that. And I would say, can you do this or do that? I will take care of it right now. I'll see him later on in the evening. I said, did you take care of that stuff over in surgery like I asked you? Oh, I'm going to take care of that right now. As always, I'm going right now. Some of us need to understand that to keep telling God, I will, I will, but you won't. It's not obedience. Amen. Obedience is doing what God says to do when he says to do it, how he says to do it. Amen. That's obedience. To leave nothing out. Some of us want great blessings from God, but we won't be obedient from here to that door. Amen. Station identification, Paul. That's when they interrupt the message and go to the commercial. But there's going to be no commercial. Obedience is what it takes. Don't let anybody kid you. Do you know there are people out there who are preaching from a pulpit? Preaching from pulpits. Because you don't have to obey everything the Bible says. There's people who are teaching that. Who are conditioning people to believe that this is just another book. 
That this book was written by men and you can't take everything word at word face value. No, it was written by a whole bunch of men. Friend, let me tell you, you can get five doctors in this room and they can't agree on everything about the heart. Uh -huh. That's right. That's right. It took 32 people to put together a compilation of the scriptures that we call the Old Testament. 32 different writers. Over the span of almost 1,400 years. They didn't sit down together and collaborate and say, what are you writing about? What am I writing about Jonah? Oh, who is that? They didn't do any of that. Uh -huh. nope. But there's no contradictions. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. They didn't do any of that. Why? Paul says in the book of 1 Timothy, it was inspired by the word of God. The word of God came by the inspiration of God. That, is, that means to be breathed out. We need to know what we're missing when we can't get close to God. Let God fill you with the Holy Ghost if you haven't done it. Let God know that you want to be saved. Pray. Fast. Be obedient. Don't limit God and don't limit yourself. Come boldly to the throne of grace and draw near to God. Come on, let's stand up and let's go home.